everybody. Welcome back to Find My Pass From Home. It is lovely to see you here today. Please drop us a quick comment, say hello, introduce yourself, tell us where you're tuning in from today and also what the weather's like because would it be a Find My Pass From Home without a world wide weather report? No, it wouldn't. Um, it's quite cloudy here in Edinburgh today. We have had hail. Pretty sure we had some snow earlier too. But hey ho, we're going to be talking house history today. Really exciting because this month at Find My Past, we are celebrating our local communities, their histories, what makes them special. And also, we're talking about, we're challenging you basically, um, researching your local businesses, your local area, your streets, your towns, and also on the online community, you know, yourselves. If somebody has helped you out, uh, with your family history or your house history, for example, um, how can you then give back to somebody else? So just something, just some food for thought, something to think about. Um, possibilities are endless with this, but today really excited to welcome back returning guest. We're going to be talking about house history, about her research, and also she's going to be answering your questions. So welcome back, Melanie Back Hansen. Hello. <laughs> Lovely to have Great you back. To be here. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Yes, very good. Thank you. Brilliant. Now, Melanie is a house historian. She's a writer. She's a speaker. She's got 15 years of experience under her belt, which is just astounding. And she specializes in the history of houses, of streets, and also in social history as well. She's the author of three books, um, which you can find online. And Niall is in the comments. So hopefully he can pop some links in the comments for you. And she's a regular contributor to television, to print, and to radio. Have I missed anything? Uh, I don't think so. I think that kind of covers it all, you know, apart from all these online talks through through all the several lockdowns. And, and then when we are allowed out and about, I do do talks and lectures to real people. So that, you know, <laughs> to, to crowds of people that I can speak to in person. But but yeah, that that's me in a nutshell. <laughs> and you've got an exciting um, talk coming up on the 15th of May, haven't you? Do you want to tell us a little bit more about that? Yes, yeah. Um, it's it's in collaboration with House History Hour, which is on Twitter. Um, so some people might know about that. Um, and there's a sort of a group of house historians with, with varying degrees of different experience in researching the history of houses. Um, and we've come together to do the first house history show um, along with Family Tree magazine. Um, so it's really exciting. So on Saturday, the 15th of May, there's a day event and there'll be a range of different talks. So it's going to kick off with myself and Deborah Sugrayan, and we're going to be talking about a house through time um, and our experiences on the show. Um, but then there'll be a range of other talks, different periods of houses, different challenges, different tools to use, you know, uh, how to get beyond brick walls if you're, you know, pardon the pun, but you know, like you're actually, you know, all, all things house history on the day. And then that will be followed by subsequent lectures and talks on four following Thursday nights. So there's a whole range of different things. So anyone who's got even, you know, if you're a beginner, if you're experienced, whatever your, your sort of take on house histories, um, it's, yeah, it's going to be really good. Fantastic. Um, is there anything you can tell us about a house through time? <laughs> Uh, well, um, as you can imagine, with the whole lockdowns and coronavirus, et cetera, et cetera, there have been a few speed bumps along the way. Um, so uh, I think most people know that the, the area is going to be Leeds. Um, and that was actually announced last last time the program was on, which I'm trying to remember how when that was. Um, but uh, so the house is in Leeds. Um, and I actually helped the program research at, at extraordinary house um, that was sort of dating back to the 17th century. They wanted to do a much older house. Um, but then we had lockdowns, everything changed. And so they had to go to sort of a plan. I think it could have been plan B or C or even D or E. <laughs> um, but it's it's kind of exciting. They have started filming. So it's happening um, in terms of actual uh, when it's going to be aired, uh, I, I don't know is, is the simple answer, but it's happening. It's definitely happening. And, and they're filming as we speak. So that's exciting. Brilliant. So watch this space, everybody, because it's I can't wait for it to come back. It's just yeah. it's compulsive viewing. Yeah, it really, really is. 
Um, let's welcome some of the people in the comments today, our lovely community members. Who have we got? We've got Terry from Glasgow. We've got Daphne from a sunny Somerset. We've got June joining us from New Hampshire. Um, we've got Hilary from the Conway Valley in Wales, land of my fathers. Um, mm -hmm. Rosie from a soaking Shropshire. It's not right. nice in the UK today. It's just, it's not pleasant. <laughs> I thought this was supposed to be May, but, um, but hey ho. Mm. Um, yes, Patricia also saying the, wedful, the, re the weather is dreadful. Get the words the right way around. Um, fantastic. Okay, so I can already see some questions coming in. So what we're going to do is we're going to have a bit of a house history chat but Melanie has also agreed kindly to answer some of your questions. Now we've had some of them submitted already. So what we'll do is we'll tackle those first, but then what we'll do is later on throughout the broadcast, we'll do live questions. So if you do have a house history conundrum or question for Melanie, please pop it into the comments and just add the word question or cue at the beginning, just so it's easy for me to pull them out of the comments and I can show them on screen and it will be great. So we're gonna have a really fun hour. Um, now let's have a look at some of these pre-submitted questions, if that's all right with you, Melanie. Mm -hmm. So the first one we had was from Daphne and she asked, if one is renovating a very old house and finds historical artifacts, would one, the owner have to notify a heritage organization and two, who pays for the examination of the site? Yes, right. Well, this I have to admit, I uh, this is something I've never come across uh, in, in my research. But so I actually sort of called on a few other house historian friends and um, I did a bit of digging myself. But it's basically it can depend on if you find something tucked away in your attic or if it's, you know, or yeah, uh, vice versa, if it's something you dig up in your garden and you know you suddenly find a, a pot of gold at the bottom of the garden, then it basically depends. Um, but in essence, the key thing is to contact the Finds Liaison Officer. Um, and there are different ones for each county or each region. Um, so it, it can do, basically depends on what it is. So it, if it, if literally, if it's a stash of gold or silver or something, um, then, then definitely there are some specific things in place for a treasure find, and that will involve different things. But in essence, if you contact the finds liaison officer, they'll be able to uh, evaluate and, and tell you what to do next. Um, so yeah, it just, if it is, you know, you, you're ripping up floorboards and, you find a trinket from the 1930s, then that's that's perhaps that's yours effectively. But if it is something uh, very historic or yeah, it's something that that needs a, a qualified archaeologist or, or historian to evaluate, then that's the way to go. So basically, if I find if I'm digging around in my garden and I find a coin from the 50s, that's mine. If it's a coin that seems to be, I don't know, Saxon or Roman, that's when you need to call someone. Yeah, yeah. And certainly, well, if it, even if it's the 1950s, but if it's a bag of them, I think there's there's something about uh, if there's, I actually don't know the specifics, but if there's more than sort of six or seven of them, then then that's qualified as a hoard. And so then you start getting into different, yeah. So So it can depend on a lot of different things. But I think if in doubt, contact, email the finds liaison officer for your area. If you just if you just sort of put that in a search engine and just you'll find the one that's relevant to wherever that wherever you are and then go, get in touch with them. Brilliant. Well, Daphne, I hope that answers your question. Really good question, actually. Hmm. Um, next one is from Michelle, who says, um, how would you find out when your house was built and who built it? Yes, and this is actually quite a common question, but at the same time, it's quite tricky to answer. Um, it's it's sort of in a lot of ways it's it's very difficult to be precise about when you know, when your house was built um so it can be quite tricky there's 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 just not the records around you especially even if you're going back to sort of the 20th century but obviously if you're going back even further there just weren't the the processes in place that we have now for planning applications and building regulations and that sort of thing they developed over time and only really became sort of part of our building construction world in the 20th century 
Um, so basically, it's a case of piecing together lots of different sources. Um, so, for example, I'm researching a house in London at the moment. It's fairly central London. Um, I know through some, uh, well, the Survey of London has a lot of information, but also um, there's some plans and details that, that describe there was a building lease in 1838. But through looking at rate books, looking at uh, electoral registers, looking at directories, the first occupants only really start to appear in the records in about 1843. So between 1838 and 1843, there's actually no specific thing that says the house was completed in 1841 and the first people moved in in October. You know, I mean, sometimes you can find those records. Um, so rate books are a good thing for that. They normally, if in 1841 there's no one and then all of a sudden 1842 there's someone at the house then you can kind of piece together but in terms of specifics it can be quite tricky and particularly for older houses that's where you know they're, they're just unless there's a gold mine of deeds that give you like literally every detail um, and you can sometimes find those but it, it yeah in a lot of cases it's piecing together different sources and coming up with a rough date um, and certainly in terms of who built it, that also is quite difficult, um, especially, you know, if you think about the Victorian housing boom, a lot of a lot of houses uh, and even pre-Victorian time, builders and carpenters and the, the way houses were built, they weren't regulated in the same way that we have now. And they didn't have sub to submit plans. And actually, a lot of builders just followed sort of co um, book designs and mm -hmm. they had a rough template about this is what a house needs to be in some cases there was a developer and they brought in a bricklayer then they brought in a carpenter then they brought in a, and actually so there's very little details about this person built the house in 1841 or whatever it is so yeah bit of a detective job on on piecing together the the different elements so yeah hope that helps brilliant um I think it goes for family history as well as house history. You know, there's 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 not a you know a, a hidden place somewhere in an in an archive that's got a box with just th with all the yeah. things that you need that's going to answer all of your questions, and that's it's all it. going to be on one document. It's going to yeah. be, as you say, it's it's a it's detective work, isn't it? It's taking little bits from each of your sources and piecing yeah. together that puzzle. Now, I'm quite lucky. The building I live in has 1872 stamped on the top of it. <laughs> At the, at the end nice. of the street. Nice. Yes. Although so, I should I should point out that sometimes they can be misleading as well. So you can I mean if you match the architecture to the date, you could probably be, you know, you, you get a rough idea. But sometimes I did some houses in Hampstead years ago and they had a date plaque and it said 18 gosh, no, no, the date plaque said about 1740 something. But the houses were they were clearly not that old they were Victorian it was a Victorian row of, of sort of laborers cottages and so actually it, it turns out that was a plaque from a previous row of houses and cottages that was put on yeah so actually you you, you got to again like you said actually it's piecing together different sources so actually if you look at the architecture and actually then and with the date and then you look at some of the sources and you see in the rate books your house appeared in 1873 or something and you, yeah you can kind of be sure about the date <laughs> i must admit that that's what i've done i've you know i went into the into the census records and i can't find i can't find this building before 1881 right and yeah it was, it was pretty much the same with the newspapers so that would fit in so i think they were telling yeah. the truth yeah i think especially paper. that yeah that kind of date i think you're probably safe yeah <laughs> Lovely. Okay. Lots of lots of good questions coming in. Keep them coming in, everybody. We're just going to finish up some of these pre-submitted ones and then we can do some live ones. Mm -hmm. so, next question was from Julie. How do I find out who owned properties from 1800 onwards and pre-1800? Yes, this is also another excellent question. And it just it also highlights a very key element with house histories is that quite often, certainly, you know, before the 20th century, most people didn't own the house that they lived in. Actually, there was, uh, you know, most, uh, even by what well, the dates are about 1914, 10 to 12% of people owned their own home. So that leaves about 88 to 90% of people who rented. And that's all different sort of 
um, groups of society. So you could have a very well-to-do middle-class household, but actually they didn't own the home, they rented. So, so it's a good point when you're looking at house histories that there are different sources for ownership and different sources for occupation. Um, and it can get tricky. So probably, um, I mean, this, you, yeah, if you're working back through the history, working backwards in time is one of my key tips. And actually, you will find perhaps documents now that give you the details of the owner, or perhaps you know from land registry that that there was a certain owner in the 1970s or the 1980s, or and then you put that going back with different sources. Um, in terms of specifically identifying an owner and occupier, one of the best is the 1910 valuation or the inland revenue valuation um, that was produced in the years uh, just before the First World War. The, the main uh, documents are held in the National Archives, but you can also find doomsday books, they're often called, or valuation books in different county record offices. Um, and they, off, they basically will give you um, the owner and the occupant, and then a valuation of the property, and then perhaps a brief description. Um, and then other tax records tend to be also helpful for this. So things like rate books, um, although that also can be confusing because often the rate payer was the occupant. So, it's, But some records will give you both the owner and the occupant, just depends on the dates available. Um, things like land tax as well, that also can give you the owner and the occupant. So it's, you, they're different sort of um, sources, which again, you've slotted in with other sources. So it, it can be, you can't, as you were saying earlier, there's not one file to go to. Um, I mean, you can be really lucky and land registry might have some historic elements of ownership. Um, the earliest I've found was the late 19th century, but on the whole land registry only have the most, you know, back to the 1980s kind of thing. So if you've got a house that was built in 1720, you have to go to different sources. Um, and if you can find the deeds, that's obviously um, the best place. But a lot of the time the deeds uh, don't survive. Um, but again, if you're tracing it back and you find that your house was part of a, a manor, so you can look at manorial records, um, you can look at estate collections. So if it was part of a, a landed estate, so there was a, a landowner like the Duke of Devonshire or something, um, just as a, a random name. But uh, then if there's an estate collection in the archives, you could perhaps find rent books, uh, again, some sort of rate books, surveys, which will list. So there's a lot of different things and it just depends on where your house is situated. Um, and and then the nuances of that particular house. So it's there's no sort of one one answer, I'm afraid. <laughs> yeah, it's not there's not a one size fits all with house history. No. no. <laughs> Nor is there with family history. Anywho, yes, lovely. Yeah. Um okay, next question we've got here is from Carla. How would I find the plans or original drawings for my 1850s house? Is there an archive? Um the short answer is is no, <laughs> um, but again, it depends on the house. Um, but it also go back, goes back to what I was saying earlier about um, the sort of evolution of, of planning and building regulations. Um, and so historically, there, there wasn't a need to submit plans. So even if you, yeah, you've got a sort of a mid 19th century house, um, in a lot of cases, you didn't need to submit plans. Um, but if there were any plans, they tended to be related to public health. So in this time when you've got things like terrible drainage, uh, sanitation was, was terrible in certain areas, there were started to be improvements in how to manage these kind of terrible things. But it was it was largely connected to public health and disease. So this is a time when you had, you know, numerous um spreads of disease of cholera and, and typhus and all sorts. And so actually that's the early sort of introduction of some of these um, regulations was largely to, to sort of stem the spread of disease rather than to uh, bring in sort of structure uh, to how we built our houses and how people lived. It, that was a sort of um, an effect of it, but it wasn't the main reason behind it. Um, but different um, government acts were brought in during the late 19th century 
And so it's it slowly became more required that you might need to submit plans. But in a lot of cases, um, they didn't survive. So again, it's a bit tricky. You can find things like um, drainage applications. Um, they tend to be more like 20th century when alterations were being made and it was more of it was required to submit plans. So but for the 1850s, it's highly unlikely. You might you might just, you know, strip what's the expression? Strict gold, struck gold. <laughs> um, but um, it's yeah, it's it's not likely. But I mean, basically, my answer to that would be get in touch with the local county record office because there may it may have been part of a historic estate, as I was saying earlier, and they may hold plans when they were developing build you know houses on their estate or something like that. Um, so, but if there is anything, it will be in the county record office. So, yeah. Yeah, lots of places to check there. Actually, yeah. just as an aside, my mother is trying to sell my grandmother's house because she's moved. And um, we've suddenly got very interested in the history. And we, I was always told that it was about 100 years old, this right. house, in, house in North Wales. And, um, and then I was told that it used to be a, because it's, it's a two-story with a guest house, found examples in the newspapers of it being a guest house and it being advertised as such. But then I was told that before that house was built, that there was a thatched cottage on that site. And my mum actually has a photograph of it um, that I think was given to her by my grandmother or my grandfather. But look, you know, ask around, see who does have, you know, photographs, plans, mm -hmm. old maps. Um, they also had a an old map of the land which was quite good. So it, it highlighted, you, you can see where the new houses have popped up after that. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing I found quite interesting was just up the road, there's a pub on the corner by the church, right? And there's a big car park out front. And my mum pipes up the other day. She goes, oh, they didn't, I, well, apparently there used to be a row of cottages along there where the car park is. I'm like, right, okay. So then I actually just, I head on into, into you know, a quick internet search and I'm searching yeah. for, you know, local, Melodon local history, for example. And you'd be surprised at the amount of books that you can find on local, from local historians and they often have pictures in. And I found mm. a photograph of the old cottages. Oh, brilliant. That is and then very I, cool. I took a quick snap of it and I sent it to my mum and she sent it to my grandma and... It's just really nice to see. Yeah, no, that's really true. Actually, another house I'm doing at the moment in Kent, and actually it was only built in the early 1900s, but actually there's very few records. And even though it's not that old, technically, it's, there's, there's yeah, there's there's a lot of mystery around the house. And it turns out I got in touch with the local history society. And on the on the ordnance survey maps, which uh, yeah, is another great tool to go to, but if you, in 1906, there is a house on that site. and. I'd been told the house was only built about 1917. And I'm like, well, there's a house there, 1906. So something's wrong there. Um, <laughs> but then, yeah, exactly. Um, but then actually, if you look closer, well, the only reason I looked that close is because the local history contact sent me a postcard of the site. And it was a bungalow that is not the house that's on there now. So it's a really strange thing. But actually, then if you look at the map, you see that the outline is completely different to what was there by the 1920s. So this is really curious thing where actually there was nothing there in the 1890s. Then there's this bungalow. And within what must be only about 15, maybe 20 years max, they've knocked down the bungalow and built something completely different. But it's really, you know, like, especially for early 1900s, you think it would be a given that, that the map will tell you everything. It's, you know, it's all there. But it was only through the local history group and they sent me this postcard. I was like, oh, my God, it's a completely different house. So, yeah, it's it's always worth getting in touch with them. I think that's incredible. And also, you know, for houses that aren't there anymore, it's not just yeah. the houses that aren't there in my head. I'm like, you know, there were actually, you know, there were people who lived there. They, you know, raised families. They made their own yeah. memories and had their own challenges. And I just think it's sometimes quite sad that, it's not just yeah. the house that's gone, it's also that, but I'm getting yeah. ahead of myself. Yeah. Okay. Last pre-submitted question was a long one from Jackie. So I'm just going to read the first part of it, but I've sent you the whole thing. So you should have all yeah. the info. So Jackie says, I found, I've tried finding the owner of my house my grandparents were living in from 1932 to 1956. 
Um, I lived there from 1950 to 1953. I know they rented it from an aunt and she was actually looking to see who owned it from her death until her grandmother moved out. I haven't read the whole question there. Yeah, yes. it is quite, yeah, there's quite a lot of information there, but um, it actually kind of goes back to the question we had earlier about ownership and how you how you track that. And it does appear that uh, even though, again, it's only the, 90, the, the 20th century, um, it seems most likely that that the people living in the house did not own it. Um, I mean, I, it's only based on the information I've got here, but it does seem that the people were were renting. They might have been long term renters or, or leaseholders, but it doesn't look like they actually owned the property. Um, and the question goes on. Uh, the person has put, uh, sorry, Jackie has put that she did get in touch with land registry, but again, their details only go back to 1989. Okay. Um, but there is reference to a, co a, a covenants um, because of a covenants, I'll say that, um, in 1905 um, between the Urban District Council and someone called Frederick Pluck. It said like quite a cool name. Um, <laughs> but I, I guess my question was um, that whether that she she assumes Frederick is the builder and, and the, co the covenants involved is actually um uh, they uh give an instruction to build the house at that time but it's not giving the owners so i mean i guess my my um instinct would be to check out frederick plug for a start and make sure that he is the builder um but also again looking at the 1910 valuation which i mentioned uh earlier because that will that will certainly set if the house was built in 1905 1906 1907 it should appear in that evaluation around 1910 to 1914, 15. And that will specifically say the owner and the occupant. Um, that will probably be the best source. Um, but it does appear from the information she's given, it does look like there's people coming and going. She's looked at electoral registers and it's, la it's largely people who are residents, but they're not uh, owners. So that's the way it does appear. So. Um, but I would, yeah, check out the valuation. Um, that would be the best source. And that should hopefully answer the main question. Fantastic. OK, now we're going to take a quick pause on questions. And I thought it might be quite fun to chat about. I don't know, I don't know how to phrase this. The, your most favourite house that you've ever <laughs> researched, I suppose. <laughs> um, why was it special to you? What can you tell us about it? Um, that is a great question and I, d I have to admit I struggle with it every time because I tend to get so engrossed in whatever I'm researching at the moment and I always find them so interesting. Um, but probably the best one um, is a house in the Cotswolds and I actually might have spoken about this before, I can't remember, I, I use it as an example in some of my talks. Um, but the house itself, the oldest part of the house um, was, I mean basically you go to the house and there's the kitchen which has got walls you know this thick you know like proper old school um and you're like okay this this house is much older but then there was an, an addition that was um predicted to have been put on late 18th century um but in essence the house um gosh it was such a a gold mine because part of the reason i like it as well is because it was a challenge because when i first started researching it i actually only got back to the late 18th century and hit a lot of brick walls. I couldn't find the sources, knowing that it was it was definitely older, but the sources ran out. Um, certainly within the time I had. Um, then the owner actually said, "Well, look, let let's do a bit more, spend a bit more time." And that was what was brilliant because I dug further, found essentially um, all the, the the deeds that I needed um, in Birmingham archives. The house is the house was in. Worcestershire it's now in Gloucestershire um so I, but then so I you know in terms of finding sources it was I was all over the Midlands basically um but uh it, I found a deed in 1764 it was a marriage agreement and it it basically pieced back the provenance of the property to the 16th century um and then there were further deeds that filled in gaps and then alongside that there were estate records because it used to be part of the um it used to be owned by the bishops of Worcester so I found that in 1588, uh, it was actually granted to Queen Elizabeth I. So I then, yeah, had that moment in the archives going, oh, no, oh my God, you know, like, yeah. So that was 
So that was pretty cool. Um, and then it turns out she didn't hang on to it for long. So the bishops of Worcester gave her, it was their house and the property and actually a whole lot of property around Worcester. Um, she gave it to her personal physician, um, who at the time was a man called Dr. Lopez. Um, and of course, in my, this is the time of the Spanish Armada, and there's also threats against her life with the Portuguese and the Spanish, and there's, there's all sorts of, you know, court drama and intrigue. Um, and as it happens, Dr. Lopez gets a bit caught up in all this court intrigue. And he, he essentially is accused of trying to poison the queen. Um, and then, so, uh, so it, the, it's quite funny because it, she was, it, he was accused by um, the Earl of Essex. And one of the reasons put in, literally in the history that I was reading, was that actually he used to be the doctor for the Earl of Essex. And he let it slip to a couple of his friends that uh, he was treating Essex for venereal disease. <laughs> and Essex didn't like this very much. So his way of getting back at Dr. Lopez was to, to put him at the forefront of this accusation of poisoning and treason and all sorts. Anyway, so this is all kicking off. Um, in the end, Dr. Lopez was found guilty. He was, uh, yeah, he was executed for treason in 1594. So this is all through the avenue of a quiet gentleman's house down in the Cotswolds. Um, and then a couple of hundred years later, it turns out the owner of the house was a man called John Wheatcroft. Um, and he ended up moving to France in the 1780s, uh, 1790s. And he became a very successful merchant. But this is obviously at the time of the French Revolution. So there's all sorts going on there. Um, but he was based in Le Havre and they would, he was flourishing. So much so that he was quite a respected man in the area. He became friends with Thomas Jefferson, the future president of the United States. Uh, and it was really great. I found letters between them. They remained friends after Jefferson and his family went back to America. Um, and then at the same time, he became friend, Wheatcroft became friends with Mary Wollstonecraft, who was also in France at the time. Um, and she actually rented rooms from him in Le Havre. And that was where she gave birth to her first child, Fanny Imlay. And John Wheatcroft is on the, the register of birth. So there's like, yeah, as you see, it was just, you know, in terms of finding brilliant stories. I mean, then there was so much more to it. Like that, you know, there was lots of other stories about people. Yeah, I, so much that you could write a whole book on. I mean, I basically did write a whole book on it for the for the owners. Um, so that's definitely kind of up there as as my as my favorite house. So. Yeah, I think for me, what what that enti what that entire story, which is so varied, highlights yeah. is that when you do house history, you're not just researching when a house was built, when it had an extension, who owned it. You're also looking into the the lives of the people who were involved yes. in this property and what happened in the vicinity. And yeah, yeah, and that's, I mean that yeah, that's totally what gets me is all the social history around it and what that leads to, like. The people themselves could be at the heart and soul of a, a brilliant story about, I don't know, the, going off to fight in the First World War and, and earning the George Cross or, you know, what the, you know, whatever. Um, or or it could be the lives of the, the servants. Um, actually, in that same house, there was a story where um, a maid caught a man in the kitchen trying to steal um, ham from the kitchen larder. And it's all in the newspaper report that, the, so the, the maid screams and there's all this. So, but I mean, he ended up being found guilty and, you know, um, uh, what was it? Found, sent for three months hard labor. And I actually said, but then there's this whole story about people's lives at the time. This was a desperate man and, you know, there was depression in, in the agricultural regions of the country. And it, so actually it just opens up this whole world of, so many different stories of people and their lives and how they lived and what happened and so yeah totally just <laughs> also <laughs> if i'm remembering correctly wasn't essex executed himself for treason oh oh gosh actually i don't remember i don't uh i might need to check but the, yeah the, the, i might the, need to check that too i don't know <laughs> Mm, I know there was a lot going on. I ended up watching a whole lot of other documentary programs about him. And he was, yeah, he got into a lot of trouble with sort of Elizabeth spy um, catches and people. So, yeah, there was a whole lot going on. <laughs> I think I think that's a subject for a whole other discussion. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. OK, let's go back to some live questions because we've had some great ones here. Uh, let's go to Paul to begin with. So 
I'm, question, I'm struggling with house numbers that just aren't on the census, just a road name, as I don't know the area I'm looking at. Is there a standard way they were recorded to work out the numbers or do you have any tips? <laughs> um, it's a really great question because house numbers can be uh, a struggle. Um, and not only did they change around or actually in, in a lot of cases, they didn't have house numbers, you know, that actually it was literally Mary's cottage at the end of the village or you know John's farm on the way to wherever um so it is a bit tricky with that and also census records in especially in the rural locations they often recorded an entire village under just the name of the village or the name of the road in this case um so it can be tricky but sadly there is no standard way they they changed a lot they you know as i say when house numbers were introduced it was largely for the postal service and so um there was a lot of rearranging um, in a lot of cases, you had one row of terraces that actually could have been, you know, Victoria Terrace numbers one to eight. Then it changed. It was part of Victoria Street and it changed to, you know, a different set of numbers again. Then it was reorganized when there were more houses built at one end of the street. So it, it changes a lot. So I, in order to sort of work this out, it is a case of, again, trying to find different sources. So it depends on the area. It depends on what's online. You say you're not from the area, so it can be a bit tricky. Um, but perhaps things like directories, um, it depends on what, what era you're looking at, whether it's sort of early. Something like, um, if it's early on, so around the 1841 time, you could look at the tithe map um, and the apportionment, which will, basically it's a map where properties were surveyed when they were changing the way the tithe was being paid. It was it was changing from a, a goods tax to a monetary system. So they were working out how much to pay. But the surviving maps and then uh, the apportionment alongside will give you the name of the owner and the occupant. But it also, because you've got the map, you can look at the specific house you're looking at. So you might not have the number, but you can work out, you can see the number of the houses and work out which is your house based on the current you know layout. Um, if it's later, then yeah, perhaps more tax records. Um, it is, yeah, sadly it is a case of kind of back to detective and piecing together a few different sources. Um, so again, I, the house I'm doing at the moment in, in the middle of London, it was built 1841, 42, and it had a completely different sequence of numbers. And the neighboring house, for some bizarre reason, it was number sort of one to 21 in that side of the road. But for some reason, the neighboring house, instead of being number 15, it was named 14 and a half. So, yeah, I don't, that was the only one out of the whole street that had a weird number. And it was all built at the same time. It's not as if it was squeezed in, you know. It's something um, from Harry Potter, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, maybe that's it. Um, but as it happens, because there was so it was really bizarre. So actually in directories I was looking at, it changes to 14A, 14 and a half, 13 and a half. And it mixes because my the house I was researching was 14. It actually gets muddled up with it. So actually sometimes it appears in the directories as 14 and a half and 14 and a half gets numbered 14. And so there's also, so actually it was only through looking at directories, rate books, electoral registers, uh, census that actually I could piece together and make sure I was looking at the right house but yeah sadly it's if you're just looking at the census it uh you can sometimes do things like work out where the pub is or if you've got the vicarage at the end of the road or the church sometimes you can work out you know through different years the sequence and the way some censuses also have the very first page if you're looking uh say it's a whole village and you've got the whole parish or the ward that that is recorded within. If you go to the very first page, it usually has a description of that area and it might give you details about which way the enumerator went. And so that might also have some clues, but yeah. I hope that helps. Yeah, <laughs> house numbers are a bit of a pain, aren't they? Yeah. Um, I was looking up one of my ancestors who lived at 60 St. Catherine Street in Gloucester, I think the I think in the 1880s. Mm -hmm. So I looked it up on, on Google Maps, because I like to have a look. Mm -hmm. And I, I, mentioned, I mentioned this in the comments on Friday's Live last week, I think. And it went 66, 64, and then you could very easily see that the rest of the terrace had been demolished. 
Uh, and there was some some random other building in its place. And I, I got really, really sad when I saw that. Oh. And then I went and had a look at another census and it said that they lived at 66. Uh-huh. So then Miko said, because I spoke to Miko about it, and he said, um, was it, is it possible that they're the same house and that it was re renumbered? So now I'm like, mm-hmm. Uh, yes, very probable. <laughs> Okay, let's do another couple of questions. Actually, a quick uh, comment from Angela who said, I would just like to say thank you to Fama Past. I've just managed to find uh, my house in the 1939 register. Yes, mm, that's excellent. what we like to see. Very cool. Okay. Question from Carol. How do you find out who lived in a house pre-census dates? My husband was born in a very old farmhouse and it would be good to know who lived there before. Thank you from Northumberland. Yes. Um, now this does get tricky because um, there, there, you know, there are fewer records prior to the census. Um, but you can. I would first look at uh, the tithe map that I was talking about, which is which is a great source, which will give you uh, the name of the owner and the occupant, and also you can identify the house on the map. Um, prior to that, you can then look at things like land tax, um, and I just I'm not sure about Northumberland specifically or where the house is. Um, but they should roughly go up to about the 1830s. Most go up to about 1832. Um, and that's largely because land tax prior to 1832 was actually used as proof uh, for voting because voting was based on your property ownership. So the land tax records were actually used to verify your eligibility to vote. I didn't um, know that. But after 1832, the change in the electoral system meant that the land tax records weren't used in the same way. Um, but so if you can, if you can look at the tithe and then you've got the 1841 census and if you can just squeeze back to the land tax or rate books. Um, again, if you're looking, perhaps uh, if you know who the owner, if it's part of a manor or part of an estate, perhaps there are records there that there might be. Um, yeah, surveys or rent books or or other deeds that are connected. Um, yeah, it does start some of the rural areas do start getting tricky because there are fewer records. So it is just a case of, I guess, yeah, just piecing together what you can find. Um, and you'd pro I best best place to, to get in touch with is the county record office where the farmhouse is situated, just to see um, if you do, again, the tithe will tell you who the owner is. So actually that will be a big piece of the puzzle if there's some kind of, maybe there are deeds in a in an old solicitor's collection uh, or if, yeah it was part of the manor or something and that would give you the next step about where to go and hopefully the next options of sources so hopefully right i'm gonna flick on through the questions because i want to make sure we get through as many of the questions as we can um this is from adrienne and she asks mm -hmm. in brisbane 1900 would they have had to file building plans um, que Queensland seems to have regulated everything from the late age 1800s. The streets were laid out carefully. Okay, this is a good question because I don't know about Australian. Uh, I am assuming you mean Brisbane, Queensland, Australia. Um, but yeah, I actually don't know because uh, obviously each country will have its different regulations and different laws in place. Um, so I, yeah, I can't answer that question. But again, I would. Uh, well, there's two things. I would get in touch with the local area for where the house is situated. And again, if there's a local museum or a, a local history group or there's the local archives or if it's perhaps in sort of a Brisbane archives or something, get in touch with them, see if they've got guides on, on what's available. Um, I do. There are a sort of um, there is actually a house historian I know through Instagram who is in Australia. So you can sort of search for her. Um, but yeah, sadly, I don't know the specifics about what what was in place in Queensland at that time. So sorry. That's okay. It's always good to have a starting point in any case mm. of where you can go and ask. Okay, we've got a question from Sue, who says, "Hello from Bangkok. I've noticed on the census that sometimes street names seem to change, and sometimes street numbers seem to change, or are not recorded, as we've already said." Yeah. And she says, "Are there any suggestions for sources that would help understand these changes?" uh sadly no i think is probably again that it, it it varies on a lot of different things um 
and they do change you're, you're quite right it's very common for, for street names and street numbers to change um and it it's largely in essence it's the social history of of expansion in britain and that's you know you're looking at 19th century into 20th century um so from the early victorian period you've got you know certain population certain uh number of streets and ha houses in different areas and then you've got a massive population explosion and so it's it's actually looking at the social history and the changes both within the whole of Britain, but also within the area for where you're looking. And it may have been that there was, I don't know, there was an, a, I don't know, there was an expansion through industry. And so actually there was a, a burst of housing development or say for London, you've got the underground and the, the railway lines expanding. So you've got growth in different areas based on um, tra transport. Um, so there's a lot of different reasons that it basically, it could be that yeah new houses were built and expanded and things changed um and in a lot of cases later in the 19th century they had to reorganize everything because there was there were so many pockets of lots of houses being built that they actually had to come in and try and organize it all um and there's even things like uh, it's the um it's the metropolitan board of works in in london but uh, there were across the country there were different obviously just uh, authorities who had to come in and change things particularly things like very common street names so they had to re rename a lot of streets just because there were so many victoria streets like obviously there was high so much street. expansion in yeah high street station road you know like all these very very common but especially things like you know you've got massive victorian expansion at the uh, you know when victoria comes to the throne so there were so many different streets called Victoria Street and it was causing chaos. So they had to kind of rename streets and reorganize them. So there was a lot of that. So it's it's looking at sort of a broader social history. But sadly, that doesn't help for the specifics of one particular street. Um, it may have been that there were different terraces and then they then, then they reorganized them all into one complete um, street and with all the subsequent numbers. Um, so, yeah, it's it's it. Sadly, it happens a lot and you have to look at the nuances of your specific house or street to sort of identify when and how and, and different things like that. Nuances. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, right. We've got a question from Patricia here, which I will pop up in a sec, but we will probably be able to squeeze in a couple of more questions if anybody wants to pop them in the comments because um, we're at 10 to the hour. But let's just take Patricia's question. Uh, my house was built in 1953. I have all of the old deeds and the new ones. Can I give my old deeds to the local history museum or do I need to keep hold of them? Um, I would, that's a very good question. Um, and it's actually funny because normally it's the other way around. Normally it's people trying to get hold of them. Um, yeah. But um, in essence, uh, I would check with, um, I would probably check with a legal advisor of some kind because as, as I understand it, you're only required to keep the historic deeds um, back 15 years, legal, the legal requirement. Um, and that's why actually so many deeds disappeared because you know prior to that, you, you had to hold on to them to prove ownership, but then there was changes in the law. So from about the 1970s, you only had to prove that going back to, uh, 15 years. Um, and then of course, if it's on land registry. Um, so I, yeah, it, it's, I would say it's you can give it to the local history museum, but I would probably check with a with an actual qualified legal advisor just to make sure if you've got um, a solicitor or someone who you can just check. If you obviously if you own your property outright, in most cases people the deeds might be held with a mortgage provider or something like that. But if you've not got a mortgage, then uh, and you've got them all, then uh, yeah, just double check with a legal advisor. But otherwise, you should be able to hand them to. The local archives or, or local history museum yeah i think that's some solid advice there okay now let's okay. chat tips for beginners so right i or somebody you know one of our lovely community members has just decided i'm going to research the history of the house i've just bought the history of the, of the house that i'm renovating or I'm fondly looking back to memories of my childhood and I lived in a reasonably old house and I want, I want to learn a bit more about it. Where would I start? Okay, 
I actually, probably the best thing to do, and actually given the subject of this month for Find My Past is sort of community and local history and the big, yeah, I would actually look at the local history. That's that's probably the first point um, because that will, that will give you a lot of information about the relevance and the specifics of the house within its context. And so perhaps understanding that it was built, yeah, industrial revolution or, the canals or the railways were built and there was a boom in housing um, or perhaps it was very rural agricultural community and it was very tied to an old manor or something so all those sort of nuances of nuances again but all those um those basically those differences with local history and local communities it actually really has an impact on on the history of the house and that will give you reasons perhaps why it was built when it was built and the types of people that live there. Um, so that would definitely, I would, that, that's a good, and also it gives you clues about where to go when you're looking for specific ref, um, sources. So if you know that it's actually part of a particular parish and it's been part of that parish for hundreds of years, then actually when you go to the archives or you're looking online, you know that actually the records are gonna be within that parish. Um, or even that ward, if it's, you know, if you're looking at electoral registers and things, you need to know what ward it's in. Um, then, uh, yeah, and again, if you're in the archives, a lot of these sources, tax records, uh, uh, yeah, rate books, so much is actually by the parish and the region and the area. So actually, if you know that from looking at the local history, it gives you a lot of the, the key tips. Um, so alongside that, you could, yeah, as we said, get in touch with the local history group, um, uh, then look at maps, which again is looking at the big picture, um, and that will help. The Ordnance Survey maps are the best place to go, but it depends on your area. There might be a whole whole range of different maps on your in your specific area, but the Ordnance Survey maps are really good because they are detailed enough to identify properties, and they were largely produced in 25 inch map details from the late 19th century, mid to late 19th century. And then they were periodically updated. So actually you can look at the area in the 1880s, then in the 1900s, then in the 1920s, then in the 1950s or, you know, so actually you can really track the development and you can see what's going on. And perhaps it didn't change much. Perhaps it's a small rural village and actually it hasn't changed much. In the 1880s, it was still quite a small town, but by the 1930s, it's, it's a massive town and it's expanded enormously. So it just, that also gives you a picture of what's going on. And then from there, I would look online as your, one of the comments was the 1939 register is a, a great place to go. It's, it's much easier to look for a dress. Um, so that's a good place to go. And then, yeah, it's, it's a case of piecing together the records. Um, a, a key tip I think I mentioned at the beginning is to work backwards in time and that will help spot the changes. As many people have pointed out, things like house numbers changing or or then all the street or the house number is not even recorded. You can find it easier to track and you end up tracking the people rather than the address. And particularly when you get back to earlier records where actually addresses weren't even used and it was literally the house, uh, you know, occupied by, uh, you know, Mr. Smith. And so actually you need to know Mr. Smith was there. So, you know, it's kind of, it becomes a bit of a, um, yeah, a puzzle where you're piecing together, but you end up tracking people. Um, rather than a specific address so hopefully that helps i think that's really true actually i I'm, i spoke about this when i had a, a lovely chat with uh, deborah a couple of weeks ago oh uh, um, yeah but um one of the things i've been doing is, is researching the history of this building and um as i said 1872 so one of the things i did was i went into the um the newspapers and i was looking just for all mentions of this building right and um i found loads and again it's, it's the it's the people yeah 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 so i know many. yeah i know i was doing again this london house i'm it's top of mind because that's what i'm doing at the moment but i did the same thing with newspapers and it ends up it was a lodging house for much of the 19th century and it, i found this record of basically that it was a court um event where basically the landlady was in court because there was she was complaining about beggars gathering outside the front of uh, front door and I was like, oh my gosh, what's going on here? And it turns out that one of her lodgers would throw money from the first floor window 
because he was very generous. Um, but he so that so basically all these people would gather for this money being thrown from the first floor window, and the, the, you know the the judge in the court was like, um, well, can you? stop him from doing this you know like, um and she said well no i can't i don't you know i don't want to but at the same time i can't get i can't kick him out and the court basically the judge said well can you move him to the back of the house so he can't throw money from the so it was actually but it was extraordinary. i know but i just this whole life of uh, you know this is west london you know the 80 middle of the 19th century and this whole story about the beggar boys gathering outside. It was just just extraordinary. I couldn't I couldn't get over it. So yeah, you never know what you'll find. <laughs> well, exactly. One yeah. of um one of the I don't know if it's this particular flat, but it's definitely within this number. Um one of the chaps um sadly died literally down the road on the railway line. Ah oh, that's wow. quite sad to find. Yeah. Yeah. I mean there's yeah that that comes with it. Mm. Yeah, I think it, com it comes with family history, it comes with house history. You're mm. going to find things that are a yeah. little bit upsetting, but you're also going to find things that are exciting, you know, like yes. finding a connection to um, Elizabeth I, for example. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's see if we can squeeze in some comments. And then what we'll do is we'll we'll finish up with brick walls, if that's okay. Advice on brick mm. walls. Um, Hello, Emma. Um, Emma says, Aww. I'm renovating inside, but also doing up the garden. Mel's local history tips are also useful for finding out more about the land. Mm. Apparently, my plot was a part of a large convent garden, which I very much hope to be true. Need to investigate further. Nice. Yeah. Hi, Emma. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jane, unfortunately, is saying she's got to go, but she says it's been really interesting. Brilliant um and carol coming back saying just to let you know that the northumberland farmhouse i asked about was also a medieval mill so wow. i might be able to check by local history records and thank you for mentioning local history records Excellent. Mm, great amazing okay we've got a couple of minutes left if somebody is doing their house history and they you know they hit a wall whether it's the, re the records haven't been digitized, they don't survive, or they simply weren't made, they don't exist. Mm. There's a bit of a gap. What's your first port of call? How do you approach that? Yeah, it's it's a great question. And it does come up a lot. Um, and very much for the reasons you've given. Um, basically, I it is a case of just persevering and perhaps looking at different sets of records, different sources, um, if you know, yeah, it's tricky if you're looking online. Say, for example, this house I was doing in Kent, and actually, sadly, Kent don't have a lot of records online, so it makes it very limited. Um, so fortunately, I can get to the Kent archives now. But but also, um, the house was not, even throughout the 20th century, the house isn't very clearly labelled at all. So I'm trying to trace the people. But as it happens, it was because it's a sort of seaside area. You had lots of people coming and going. So actually it's very difficult because say for example, the electoral registers, one year there's one person there and you don't have the name of the house. The next year you've got one person there and you don't have the name of the house. But So you don't actually know if it's the right. So basically you have to look at other sources. So whether that's, yeah, tax records, rate books. Um, perhaps it's also looking at um, some of the online records where you can search by a person's name and that will lead to a, an obscure source that you wouldn't have thought of, but might actually list the name. Um, so you things like immigration records, I found a few people by the fact that they were traveling to America on, on a ship in 1950 something, and actually it's got a record of their address on there. So actually there's random things like that. Um, again, sort of more genealogical sources where you actually might you know, you could try and find uh, references through um, baptisms, uh, marriages and, and burials. There might be records of, of their address on things like that. So it does, it just means you have to kind of stretch out a bit, look, you know, op open the options because in a lot of cases, the rec as you say, if they didn't even make the records, you ha you have to kind of go beyond the usual and, and, and yeah, become a detective. That's that's the the answer. I feel like for things like baptism records and marriage records, um, particularly in the more rural areas, they will actually give the name of the house sometimes. Mm. That's quite handy 
That is um, great. Yeah. Because whether you're doing house history or you're doing family history, you, you can you can track um the family a little bit mm. more easily. And also if you've got a family with a common last name like Jones, mm. in for example, <laughs> Welsh Parish Records, um <laughs> having that the abode really, really helps. Yeah, yeah definitely. Okay, well, I think it's five o'clock. Um, so this has been a fantastic hour, Melanie. And um, oh. thank you so much for taking the time to join us. Oh, it's um, been good. Any closing words of wisdom? Oh gosh. Uh, I did, well, I guess just keep going. That's probably the answer is actually just enjoy and keep going. Um, and join us for House History Show if you're still interested. <laughs> and House but, History Hour on Twitter tomorrow. Yes, yes, Thursday night, seven o'clock. Yeah. Thank you everybody for tuning in today. As always, it's been an absolute pleasure. Um, we've been able to talk about house history. We've talked about local history. We've, we've even got a little bit of family history in there today. So that is wonderful. Keep sharing your stories with us. Keep sharing your discoveries. Um, and don't forget, Alex is back on Friday for Friday's Live. So don't miss that. And next week, we've got Miko's monthly genealogy Q&A. So that to look forward to as well. Lots of people saying thank you and goodbye in the comments. So I think Aww. we will wrap it up there for the day. Take care, everybody, and enjoy the rest of your Wednesday. Thank you so much for joining Thanks. us. Bye.